on this Indiana expedition will cash in on water, the currency of life. We'll walk the creeks, swim the ponds and lakes, and float the reservoirs in search of plants and animals above and below the water. We'll see how life science is used to make the water safe on its way to your home. Try it yourself. Let's go check it out. Come on. Indiana Expeditions with Rick Crossley is made possible through the generous support of the Dr. Laura Hare Charitable Trust, enhancing Indiana's natural environment through preservation and protection of ecologically significant natural areas and promoting environmental education, stewardship, and awareness. CEFI, the Science Education Foundation of Indiana, investing in Indiana's youth by encouraging them to become scientists and engineers and to practice their careers in Indiana. Details at sefi.org. And the Center for School Improvement and Performance, Indiana Department of Education. Water, the currency of life, one of the most important resources on the planet and the one we might take for granted the most. This snow started as a snowflake thousands of feet up in the atmosphere. This water will join back to all the waters on the earth as it melts and follows the courses of streams, lakes, and tributaries all through Indiana. No matter what form it's in, water is extremely important to us. 70% of our bodies are made of water. Three quarters of the planet is covered by water. In fact, this planet shouldn't even be called Earth. It should be called aqua. This is science. Try it yourself. Rivers, creeks, lakes, and ponds. Water can take many paths on its journey to the ocean. On a search for a better understanding of the currency of life, I traveled to South America to experience the world's biggest waterway, the Amazon. We're at a high level of water. Like at home, the water in the Amazon takes many paths and creates many unique water environments. There are shallow and fast-flowing tributaries, just like the creeks that you might find back at home. There are parts of the flooded forest that can even look like some of our lakes. In fact, this river is so large that sometimes it would take an hour just to cross. But you don't have to go to the Amazon to get to know our most precious resource. Put on your old shoes because we're going on an Indiana Creek Walk. But before we go, we gotta make sure we're prepared. Okay, first of all, do we have nets? Ah, good. Do we have a bucket? Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's go. There are some pretty cool creatures that live in Indiana Creeks. And the first thing you need to look at is the things that live in the water itself. All right, let's see what we've got. Get your hands up. Right Come and keep coming is a mottled sculpin. Isn't that a strange looking fish? These are called a brook silverside, called a green sunfish. And you can tell by the striping in the face and the little mottled pattern on the side. There you go. Ah, that's a beauty, look at that. That's called a creek chub. That's a large mouth bass. You have to have a valid fishing license to keep this fish. One that I always like to look for are crayfish. Although if you're looking in a creek during the day, crayfish are hard to spot. However, if you come back to that same creek at night, maybe it would be a different story. This is science. Tonight, we're gonna go down here and see what's awake while we're sleeping. When you see a crayfish, it looks like a mini lobster. You have to be careful of the business end of the crayfish, the pinchers. Now he'll flip his tail but you can hold it safely if you carefully reach oh, yeah, right behind its job. head and hold the top of his shell. Yeah. 
If you find a crayfish away from water, more than likely it's created an underground tunnel that leads to water with a chimney on top to keep itself moist. I tried to dig one up one time, it was eight feet and I gave up. Down in the Amazon, I was on a trail one day and we came across this red, like little chimney. I'm thinking, that looks just like the ones in Indiana. So we got down on the ground and I opened the lid and I dropped the rock and it was boop. Here, and, it was, there, yeah. and so here we are, you know, thousands of miles away in the same kind of crawdad chimney in the Amazon. On, it, it just the dirt was different. Some of these may seem scary, and, and this is about as scary as it gets in Indiana. But guess what? What if we were in the Amazon jungle? There are some neat things. Would you guys like to go catch some things in the Amazon? You would? Wouldn't you be afraid? What might get you there? A uh, tiger? An Amazon? Probably not. A jaguar? Piranhas, yeah. What about, you guys ever, what, how would you like to go catching crocodiles or caiman in the Amazon? Would you like that? I sure would. In fact, check this out. We're with Eduardo here on the Sotomont, and we're about ready to try to do a hand catch of a caiman. Uh, as you can hear by the sounds, it's late at night, and he's using his spotlight to be able to blind it so we can grab it from the front of the boat. What is this here? What type is this? This is the, we call it chacarachinga. That means white alligator because of this. Very good swimming and, and to hit something sometimes, you know, they're very flexible. Look at And very strong. And very <laughs> strong. If you look at some of these beautiful adaptations, first of all, it floats on the top of the surface. So from above, it's dark green. But if you are a large anaconda or a large predator, from below, it's white and it blends in perfectly camouflaged. It also is very streamlined as it goes through the water. And as it comes up, first thing that comes up are its eyes and its nostrils where it can take a breath and submerge very slowly. So this is all about stealth and camouflage. And it's, of course, being a reptile, it means it's covered in scales. And the scales on the back here, on the back scoots, these are called scoots, and they form a nice, aerodynamic tapering to the back. This is just a beautiful creature. It's got claws, it's back legs, very strong, also webbed for swimming and fitting along the side of it like this as it goes through the water. And if you look in its mouth, it's got teeth. These teeth are nice and needle sharp for catching fish. Fish uh, is quite, quite uh, slippery. And see if we can get its mouth open here bottom jaw without hurting it. There we go. You can get a good angle of its its teeth. But probably one of the most interesting parts is the eyes. It's got two sets of eyelids. One from the bottom that comes up and then one from the front so it can open its eyes and its mouth underwater. And so we'll be letting this guy go right here off the side. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and so we'll send him back on his way. You guys got your flashlights ready? And he's gone. Did you know that you could follow a creek in Indiana all the way to the Gulf of Mexico? So we have a few more fish. Um, we must have let the crawdad go. Safely catching animals and looking at them is a great way to learn. Another way to learn about an animal is to create a model of where it lives. If your fish are from an Indiana creek like these, you need to make your aquarium as much as possible like the creek they came from. You can do this by checking the pH and the temperature of the creek 24 degrees Celsius where the fish came from and matching that in your aquarium. Also, take care to notice if the water in the natural environment is fast moving. If so, it's important to add an air stone to oxygenate the water. Now it's time to add the fish. One thing to remember is that you should not put too many fish in one aquarium. In order for the environment to be healthy, you need to make sure you have at least one gallon of water per inch of fish. In order to solve this problem, many people look to nature for the answer. And that answer is to build a pond. Man-made ponds for fish are called ornamental ponds. 
My friend Pat Millspaw has an ornamental pond in his front yard. So what do you have to do that nature will do? I know nature filters and nature feeds. What do you have to do right. here? Right. We, we put a lot of the plants in here, uh, not only for the, the beauty of the flowering part, mm -hmm. but they actually filter the water. Uh, the, the section right up there has the water hyacinths, and the, and the uh, water flows through the roots and collects all the... Uh, the waste on the root system, which makes the plants grow and filters the water uh, biologically. And we've mm -hmm. also got a, a mechanical filtration system as well. So basically all living organisms, whether it's fish or a plant, they have certain environmental, chemical, and biological needs. And so you have to supply some of these. For example, in nature, they would find their own food, but these guys have a hard time finding their own food. Yeah, they'll eat some algae and things, but we, we like to feed them a lot. Okay, I think we, we might try that. So we'll see how, how trained your fish are. Uh, do they like to eat? Uh, they're pretty trained. Let's see if we <laughs> throw a little bit down here and see what happens here. Here oh, look come. at that. Here they come. Here they come. Wow. <laughs> That's almost like liquid poetry right there. I mean, all the colors. That's beautiful. It's like a rainbow. They're beautiful. You know? A pond in nature is a stable, slow-moving body of water. The temperature in a pond stays pretty much the same, whereas in a creek, when it rains or whenever water moves through, you're always having temperature changes. Ponds, like creeks, are relatively shallow and light penetrates to the bottom. My theory is that because there's light, there will be rooted plants at the bottom. Okay, let's get started on this pond investigation. I have two of my pond pals with me today, Isabel and Caroline. You, ready, you guys ready to get in here and see what we can find? Yeah. Okay, if I fall, help me, all right? Okay. All right, I'll go first. Come on, pond pals, let's go. Okay, let's put this to the test. Are you ready, girls? Yeah! Go for it. All right. Rooted plants right here in the pond. I guess it is right. Yeah! <laughs> Great pond fun with Indiana Expeditions! Well, that proves it. Rooted plants. To learn more, I talked to my friend Jeff, who's an aquatic plant expert. Well, Indiana has a nice variety of aquatic plants that you could put in and around your pond for a decoration or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we'll see water lilies, we'll see, see things that grow on the bottom that are rooted in the water in the pond. And a lot of those have pretty flowers with them too. And then the plants that grow around the edges, the cattails and things like that are also a part of the pond that attracts the wildlife to it. The plants and animals that are in a pond are cool to investigate. In fact, it's like you can get to know the pond because of its size. But I bet there's even more to know in a bigger body of water. Let's go check out a lake. An Indiana lake is different from a pond. They're usually a little bit larger, but the biggest difference is there's different zones of plants. You have the emergent zone, like in a pond, then you have the submersed zone where there's rooted plants, but eventually in the deep part of the middle of the lake, there will be no rooted plants at all. Why? Because the sunlight can't go that deep. But around the edge, it's a very diverse place for all kinds of insects, amphibians, fish, and terrestrial visitors like raccoons. We went to observe this zone phenomena. First, we went under the water. The outer shallower edge was very much like a pond. It has rooted plants, small fish, and other water life. But when we went to the deeper part of the lake, there wasn't enough light to see. After some careful consideration, we found that the only way we could observe this zone phenomena was to take to the air. We rented a power glider and sent one of our producers up with a camera to see if we could see the zones from above. Due to strong winds, most of our footage ended up like this. But in the end, we got what we were looking for, perfect zone separation. A lake, since it has different zones, is a more diverse environment than a pond, which means there can be larger fish and different types of fish, catfish, smallmouth bass, and other fish that can get quite large in an Indiana lake. This is science, try it yourself. In the Amazon, where there is much more water, 
Some of these fish can become three meters long. But to me, the most interesting fish are the small ones. One of the most interesting and notorious of all the fish in the Amazon is the piranha. Here we have the red-bellied piranha. Ah, the red-bellied piranha. And this is the most aggressive one in this region, very aggressive. You can tell a lot about a fish by its mouth. Looking at this guy's mouth, we can tell exactly what he eats. Talk about not chewing your food before you swallow it. Most people think there's only one kind of piranha in the Amazon, but there are actually many different species, each one with teeth designed just for its prey. You get bit by a piranha, yeah, there's nothing to sew up, is there? It's a no, hole. <laughs> no, it's just a hole. Now this one has a very long mouth. What's the name of this fish? It's Cejasalmus ilongatus. Cejasalmus ilongatus. Because of the long body. Long body? So you've got the third one here, mm -hmm. the yellow type. That's a yellow piranha? Yes. Another very unusual and cool fish that has an interesting mouth is the Placostomus. It eats algae and other plant material by scraping it and sucking it. It's like combining sandpaper with a vacuum cleaner. The plant-eating mouth of a Placostomus is about as far away as you can get from the meat-eating teeth of a piranha. Uh, <laughs> has the fishing improved or about the same since you started fishing? Um, it had changed very much, you know, since I was a kid because in this lake here, it's a kind of, uh, it's like a hatchery, you mm -hmm. know. Many fish come from the main river, from Solomon's River, and they come up here for spawning. Mm -hmm. But many people, many fishermen with big boats that can carry like 10 tons of fish, they, they catch them before they get the lakes so they cannot spawn. So this, the, having them come back here is kind of important. Yeah. Is the, and that I, I know a lot of people have been working in Brazil to regulate and make sure that the fish conservation is here for next generation, so. so um, yeah, but many people are working on that and many people keep fishing very much, you know. So it's not a problem that's gonna go away. Yeah. Did you know that a person that studies fresh water is called a limologist? Conservation of resources is a major issue in the Amazon, but it's also important here in Indiana. Healthy water means healthy wildlife. A reservoir is a man-made body of water. Scientists take special care to monitor reservoirs and the wildlife around them. We're here today at Eagle Creek Park to study the life that's found at a reservoir. It's pretty exciting stuff, so join us as we motor on out into the middle of this reservoir. This is my lucky day because today I'm here with a scientist, Dr. Lenore Tedesco, at the Eagle Creek Reservoir. The uh, birds really are an incredible part. These, the reservoir in, in Indianapolis right here sits on the Mississippi Flyway. So this is a, a giant highway, if you will, of birds. So you, you call it the Mississippi Flyway, flyway. not highway. Not highway, flyway. Oh, cool. And yeah. so what is the Mississippi Flyway? It's basically a, it, it's a, a corridor, basically, mm -hmm. that the birds fly up and down. We, people might know that birds migrate. Some of the birds migrate. And when mm -hmm. they migrate in the winter and the summer, they change where they're living, mostly to follow food resources and have young. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're kind of in the middle place. Some of the birds will stay here, but a lot of them Indeed. migrate through. You can go out and be an expert bird watcher from birds all the way from South America right in your own backyard. Thanks, Lenore. Thanks Thank you, a lot. Rick. Well, obviously, there's a lot more to a reservoir than recreation. In fact, water from a reservoir is closer to your home than you might think. Keeping an eye on Indiana water is an important job for a limologist. And there are many tools they use to do this. I'm here with Lonnie Pasquale from the Center for Earth and Environmental Sciences at IUPUI. She's a scientist, and today we're gonna to learn about some of these tools. Lonnie, what's this strange looking thing from outer space you have in your hand here? <laughs> this is actually a water quality probe. Um, and a water quality probe is an instrument that can tell us such things as the temperature, the pH, or the dissolved oxygen in the water. This is a secchi dish. A secchi dish is a tool used to tell how clear or murky the water is. I still see it. And I still see it, and still see the white. And up, oh, I'm just, I just lost it. This is actually a depth finder, and it works on sonar. All you have to do is 
put this tip in the water uh -huh. and push this little button like you're turning on a flashlight and uh -huh. the depth will come up right here. How deep are we? Wow, 8.2 meters. Wonder what the water's like down there. Is there any way we could bring some of that water up? Oh yeah. I have a special sampler for that. It's called a Van Dorn sampler. What We're going to drop do? it down in the water uh -huh. if you want to let it go. Okay. And I'll send a messenger down, which is this thing, mm -hmm. and it'll close. Two. Oh, Did I, you hear two clicks? I heard two clicks. You got both of them closed. Oh, good, good, good. Now, uh, they're both closed, and look at that water. It's kind of... It's got little things floating in it, doesn't it? Yep, it's got a little bit of the sediment floating in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that water is cold. <laughs> is it cold? Yep. Feel? Oh, yeah, it's a lot colder, but... Uh, you want to smell it? Oh, oh. That stuff stinks. It smells oh, yeah. just like uh, rotten eggs. Yep, there's a lot of sulfurs down there. This is a phytoplankton net. A plankton net catches the tiny little animals that live in the water column. These animals that live in the light close to the surface are called phytoplankton. Since phytoplankton are so small, they are more sensitive to pollutants than other organisms, and they are a vital indicator to the health of the water. We think we've got some... Some zooplankton and phytoplankton, I'm sure of it. All right. Let's see how we did. Oh, look at wow. That. Yeah. It's like a snowball you shake up. It's filled with things, all kind of things, and they're all moving too. Yep. Most of those that we see jumping around in there, and they kind of look mm -hmm. a little bit like um, sea monkeys. Uh huh. They're actually these things called copepods. Copepods. Uh -huh. Copepods, and they're really cute because they've got um, a long, skinny tail and kind of a round top or a round head, uh -huh. and then they have these little. Um, wings that come out to the sides and they kind of jump around like this. You know, so I like they that. look really kind of spastic as they're popping around in there. Only a limologist would call a cocopod cute. <laughs> Natural resource experts need to monitor the water quality every day. While there is no substitute for hands-on investigation, there is a lot of information that can be gathered from the real-time buoy. This buoy has three water quality probes at different depths as well as a weather station on the surface. All of this information is sent wirelessly to headquarters where it is posted on the web. You can go to WFYI.org for a link to this buoy. As you can see, there are many ways to keep tabs on our water. In order to understand the basic principles of the process, I visited Rob Hedges' class at Creekside Middle School. What is that telling you? A 1 in 10 concentration. Salt solution is made up of water and what else? You can only expect your students to be as excited about learning as you are in teaching it. You know the model of hands-on learning is the way to go and, and science there's there's no doubt about that. First I had had some kids volunteer you know and try to order the you know the from the least concentrated of salt solution up to the greatest concentration of salt solution. Ashley our volunteer obviously found that level you could tell by the expression on her face and then to become you know, more of a scientist what they would do in order to determine what concentration levels the solution had that they were testing. The cool thing about this investigation is that it shows us how a substance is hard to detect until it reaches a certain level. Even if something you can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't see it, it's still there. And that's probably the main emphasis, my golden nugget, if you want to call it, that I wanted them to get out of the lesson. Did you know that Indianapolis Water distributes 145 million gallons of water every day? Using one gallon jugs, this would cover the field at Lucas Oil Stadium 67 times. Water is the currency of life, and I'm standing on the banks of the White River, which is a source of our drinking water. But you wouldn't want to take your glass and dip into this river. Let's go see how they turn this water into drinking water. This is where it all starts at the water treatment plant. Water from the river and groundwater from wells come into these basins. This basin takes the sediments out. It's called the sediment and flocculation basins. A chemical is put in that makes all the sediments clump together. It's called alum. It's the same thing that makes pickles snap. 
After the water is brought in and the sediments have a chance to settle down, the water passes through these really cool things called weirs. Now the weirs job is to dam up any debris like leaves or floating logs before it goes into the treatment plant where it's disinfected and filtered. To treat water, you need water. All around me are giant pipes that are bringing water in, both to be treated and to clean the filters. We're not ready to drink yet. These pipes bring massive amounts of water into the filtration gallery. At this stop in the water filtration, all the water is pushed through sand as a sand filter to remove any small particulates. I don't think it's ready for us to drink yet. I'm here at the heart of the water treatment with Mark Gray, the supervisor of the lab. The main purpose of our facility is to monitor the water quality for the city of Indianapolis and the surrounding counties. So what are some of the things that you test for in this lab to make sure it's safe? Some of this laboratory tests for pesticides, tests for herbicides. Um, we also test for taste and odor compounds because we want a, our product to be very palatable, very mm -hmm. uh, good tasting. Because most of our water comes from rivers, lakes, and streams, uh -huh. it changes all of the time. We have personnel that work in the facilities uh -huh. that sample it through the process. We also have online equipment that monitors the, the process mm -hmm. in real time. Um, so we can see what's going on, and if mm -hmm. there is an issue, we can re react very quickly um, to get the issue resolved. The water is being tested, but it's not ready to drink yet. At each stage, the water is tested to make sure things that are supposed to be out are taken out and things that are supposed to be in are in. So as you see, the raw water starts here and some of the different sand filtrations, and we want to get all the way down here to this water right here which comes out of this plant into the distribution into your homes. It's not convenient to drive down to the water treatment plant to get a nice fresh glass of water. But luckily, companies like Veolia Water distribute it to our homes where it's safe and convenient to drink. Water, the currency of life. I hope you realize how important water is to us. It's what separates this planet from all the rest. I'm Rick Crosland. Join me on the next Indiana Expedition. Indiana Expeditions with Rick Crossland is made possible through the generous support of the Dr. Laura Hare Charitable Trust, enhancing Indiana's natural environment through preservation and protection of ecologically significant natural areas and promoting environmental education, stewardship, and awareness. CEPI, the Science Education Foundation of Indiana, investing in Indiana's youth by encouraging them to become scientists and engineers and to practice their careers in Indiana. Details at sefi.org. And the Center for School Improvement and Performance, Indiana Department of Education.